Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to talk about the four levels of protein structure. Now when we talk about structure, we're usually talking about the 3D arrangement of atoms in space. And the reason that we care about protein structure is because structure impacts function. This means that if a protein does not have the correct structure, perhaps because of a mutation, then it's unlikely to be able to function correctly. Now, there are four levels of protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And those are what we're going to focus on in this video. Primary structure is often abbreviated as a one with a little degree sign. So that's the way that you can abbreviate it in your notes. Primary structure refers to the sequence of amino acid monomers along the polypeptide chain. And these amino acids are held together by peptide bonds that are formed by a kind of reaction called a dehydration reaction or a dehydration synthesis reaction. So basically this is when you have two amino acids, like I've drawn one in blue and one in orange here, and it's called dehydration because they lose a water molecule. This H and this OH come together to form H2O, and those are lost from the molecule, and the result is you get a peptide bond that's formed between this carbon and this nitrogen. And that peptide bond is drawn here in black. So this is what the primary, uh, the primary structure of, of a protein is. It's simply the amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Maybe there's 40 or 50 amino acids, maybe there's 100 or 150, maybe there's over 200, but whatever that number is, it's just the amino acids as they are lined up down the length of the polypeptide held together by those peptide bonds. Secondary structure is where we get to be a little bit more complicated. We can abbreviate secondary structure as a two with a degree symbol. So secondary structure refers to local substructures that are formed by hydrogen bonds between main chain atoms. And you might have heard of the name of some of the secondary structures, alpha helices and beta, beta sheets or beta pleated sheets. And so these are the two main kinds of secondary structure. And the important way to distinguish them from other types of protein structure has to do with the fact that they're these local substructures specifically formed by hydrogen bonds between main chain atoms. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here I have drawn a portion of an alpha helix. So we can see we've got the, the main chain is referring to this nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon uh, backbone, and also to the hydrogens that are on those nitrogen groups. We are not talking about R groups. R groups being the different groups that give different amino acids their different properties. We're just talking about the nitrogen and hydrogens, and also these carbons and the oxygens that are on them. And so I've drawn those here. The carbons are in black, the nitrogens are in blue, the hydrogens are in orange, and the oxygens are in red. And I have drawn various hydrogen bonds between these components in green dashed lines. I'm going to go over them now in purple just to make sure you can see them. But so we've got a hydrogen bond between the oxygen on this carbon and the hydrogen on this nitrogen, another hydrogen bond here, another one here, another one here. This hydrogen can form a hydrogen bond with a main chain atom that's above it. This one can form a, a hydrogen bond with a main chain atom that's below it. So it's these hydrogen bonds between the different components in the amino acids that allow this helical structure or a beta sheet structure to form. And that's what we mean by secondary structure. Now let's go on to talking about tertiary structure, which we can abbreviate like this. So it refers to the 3D globular structure formed by interactions between those R groups. 
Remember we said that R groups, which I'll circle right here, are these components that are attached to the alpha carbon in each amino acid. And these R groups have various properties. They can be hydrophilic, they can be hydrophobic. They can have a sulfur group that's capable of covalently bonding to a sulfur group in another R group. They can be charged, they can be uncharged. And so they have a lot of different potential properties. And where the secondary structure was hydrogen bonds between main chain atoms that are not part of those R groups, tertiary structure is referring to different kinds of interactions between those R groups. Salt bridges, this is another uh, word for ionic interactions. So salt bridges are when you have two different charged R groups, so one's positive and one's negative, and they can be in completely different parts of that polypeptide structure, and yet they come together in space to, to associate with each other and form an ionic interaction. Hydrogen bonds are, are similar where you have various uh, hydrophilic R groups, polar R groups capable of hydrogen bonding, and they can interact through those hydrogen bonds. Disulfide bonds are when you have two R groups. Again, they can be in completely different parts of the polypeptide chain. Both of them have these sulfurs that come together and can covalently bond to form what we call disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. And then also hydrophobic interactions. If you have R groups that are nonpolar, they don't like to associate with water or other hydrophilic things. So the polypeptide will fold in space into this 3D configuration that puts all of those hydrophobic uh, amino acids into sort of the middle of the polypeptide uh, and, and they can interact with each other there and be kind of protected from water and the other hydrophilic R groups. And so in the end, you get a 3D structure that looks something like this. You can see that it has many alpha helices, it has many beta pleated sheets, but those, so those units of secondary structure just kind of fold up based on R group interactions to create this, this functional sort of 3D structure. So now let's go on to talk about quaternary structure, which we will abbreviate like this. Keep in mind that quaternary structure does not apply to every protein. And that's because quaternary structure refers to the aggregation of two or more polypeptides. So when you have two or more polypeptides that aggregates together through a variety of potential interactions into a single functional unit, then a protein has quaternary structure. However, there are many, many proteins that, that only have up to tertiary structure. That means they've got primary, they've got secondary, and they've got tertiary structure. They're comprised of one polypeptide chain that's folded into a functional 3D unit, and that's it. They don't have more than one polypeptide, and so they don't have quaternary structure. However, many important proteins do have quaternary structure on top of the primary, secondary, and tertiary structures that they all have. And this is because many proteins are comprised of more than one polypeptide. And let's talk about three examples of that. The first one is one that you've probably heard of, insulin. So insulin uh, comes into the conversation when we talk about the human disease diabetes. But insulin is a heterodimer. And what that means, dimer means that it's composed of two polypeptides, hetero, means that those two polypeptides are different. So you have an A chain and a B chain. And the A chain and the B chain are stabilized together by disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. So they've got those R groups that have sulfurs in them uh, and, and two of those sulfurs covalently bond and that's how we get the disulfide name and that's what stabilizes insulin. And so the A chain by itself is not functional. The B chain by itself is not functional. But the two come together to form a single functional unit called insulin. Our next example is a protein that you have also probably heard of called collagen. So collagen is important for 
the tensile strength and flexibility of our skin, for example. So collagen is a homotrimer. Trimer, because it's three polypeptides, Homo, because those three polypeptides are the same. So three identical polypeptide chains that are stabilized by a large number of hydrogen bonds. And that is what forms, they actually form kind of a triple helix type structure. And that's what collagen looks like. And then our final example is another uh, commonly uh, recognized protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is important. It is at high concentrations in our red blood cells, and hemoglobin is what carries oxygen from our lungs to our tissues, uh, and so quite important for cellular function, obviously. And hemoglobin is a heterotetramer. Tetramer, because it's actually four polypeptide chains. Hetero, because they're not all the same. It's actually two alpha chains that are identical and two beta chains that are identical. And those two alpha chains and two beta chains come together and form this heterotetramer known as hemoglobin. And it is a very large protein capable of bonding up to four oxygens and transporting those to, to, uh, to tissues in the body. And it is stabilized by a variety of interactions, including salt bridges, hydrogen bonds, and hydrophobic interactions. And so keep in mind that these same kinds of interactions that stabilize tertiary structure are useful in quaternary structure as well. It's just that in tertiary structure, these are happening between R groups in the same polypeptide, and in quaternary structure, they're happening between R groups in different polypeptides. Um, if you are interested in learning some more about some of these topics, I've got a couple of other videos you might be interested in. One is a, a video on dehydration synthesis reactions and hydrolysis reactions that are useful in building up uh, polymers like polypeptides and other macromolecules. Another one that you might be interested in is my video on introduction to enzymes, where you can learn about the, uh, the function and the structure of various enzymes that are important in human physiology. So check those out and thanks for watching Biology Professor today.